Hey guys, how's it going? I'm doing all right. I'm over here in uh, Salt Lake City at the yard still. Because me and my co-driver had to part ways. Went over there and delivered that load to Cisco yesterday. It uh, delivered at 5 a.m. Took them all day to do it. Till 4 p.m. Like 11 hours. I think they forgot about me. It was like about 12, 12.30 I went in there and I was like, well, I want to check on the status of this. And they looked all confused. They didn't know where my paperwork was or anything. Then they finally found it and they were like, oh, well, go in door 59. So I did. Then it took them like another three hours to get it done. But anyway, under the story of my co-driver. Let's start at the beginning of it. See, I called him. When I called him, he seemed fine. Didn't raise no real eyebrows or anything. The only thing he was doing was talking about complaining about his previous trainers, and there were two of them. So that maybe should have been a little bit of a red flag. But other than that, I didn't notice anything, really. He was complaining they were... I don't remember that one of them was bossing him around or something, and the other one was smelly. But anyway, so I, did, I agreed to get him. So I left home and went out there, and I went up. He lives in Michigan, and I can't remember. I picked up a load in Indiana. It was going to Massachusetts, and it had to be there by 12 o'clock, 12 a.m. can't remember what day it was. But anyway, this co-driver lived up in Detroit. Well, he lived north of Detroit, but he wanted to meet at a Walmart up in northern Detroit. So I said, all right. But then he texted me saying, oh, the load in Indiana was taking forever to pick up because it was a meat load over there in, uh, I can't remember. Anyway, it took forever into the evening to be done. So when I was going to get to him, it would have been like midnight. But that's what we had to do to make the load on time. But he goes, uh, just pick me up in the morning because it's too late. And I was like, no, that's not how it works. We have to go when the load needs us to. And he was like, well, I know. I know that. So that right there should have been a big red flag. Already argumentative. So then I got over there. Well, no, then I agreed to pick him up at, I, I thought about it and I was like, well, if I pick him up by 8 a.m., we can get over there to Massachusetts in time. We'll have to run hard, but we'll have time to make it. So I told him, yeah, okay, I'll pick you up at the Walmart at 8 a.m., be there at 8 a.m. He said, all right. So then I went to a TA south of Detroit and took a seven hour break because that's all there was time for. And I left there on time. But because of like construction and traffic and everything in Detroit, traffic jams, I didn't make it till 8.30 to the Walmart. But anyway, he wasn't even there yet. And finally I got a hold of him at like 8.45. And he goes, oh well, I'll be there in 15 minutes. But he still didn't show up till 9.30. So he, by then he was an hour and a half late. And I should have got rid of him right then. And then it was almost 10 o'clock by the time we got everything on here and had our little discussion and started rolling. So we're, we're way behind. Now we don't have any more extra time. We got a bucket. So I started driving because I always do with my co-drivers. So I can talk to them and they don't get rushed into driving right away. They can get used to the truck and stuff. And I drove us out to somewhere in Ohio over there by Youngstown. And we switched out. I said, you can take over. And he was fine. He took over. And he drove good. He was a good driver. We got over there into uh, Pennsylvania on I-84. That rest area and switched out. 
and I drove the rest of the way 200 miles more to Massachusetts to CNS out there and I was supposed to be there by midnight but I didn't get there till 1230 because he was two hours late but I don't think I got a service failure because it wasn't my fault but anyway we got that one delivered and then in the morning I told him to drive it was his turn. I was going to let him start first. So he did. And we had to go pick up a high valve load up there in Maine. And we took it down to Louisville. But he drove the first part of that to Newburgh, New York. He picked it up and drove the first part of it. And he did fine. It was northeast, you know, trial by fire up there. But he did fine. And then I took over in Newburgh and drove it to Burbank, Ohio, down there on I-71 to the pilot. By then it was in the morning. His brake was over. And I had him to start driving again. And he drove down to... He finished it. He took it to Louisville. And then we delivered that. And I picked another load going to Jacksonville, Ohio. Not Jacksonville, Ohio. Jacksonville, Florida. Because there weren't, there were no choices on there. Now, there was a beer load and two Jacksonvilles, and I'm not hauling beer. And then the Jacksonvilles, one of them had a lot more deadhead than the other one. So the one I picked only had a little bit of deadhead, not very much, because we were already in Louisville and it picked up at JBS in Louisville. So that was on a Saturday, and we went over to the Loves because we didn't. I didn't know it was ready at the time, but it was. But anyway, I was tired, so I went over to the Loves. And we waited till the next day to pick it up, because we had plenty of time to just wait there. So on Sunday morning, I went and picked it up. And everything seemed fine. I was teaching him how to move the tandems. And then I drove us down to Georgia. I think it was Resaca, Georgia he took over right there and drove us through Atlanta and down to I sat up with him until we got through Atlanta and then I went back and laid down and he drove us on down to Jacksonville from there and we got down there Monday morning about 4 o'clock in the morning so the load didn't deliver till Tuesday and we had another you know we had more than 24 hours of waiting to deliver it which he wasn't happy about he started complaining about his miles and all the waiting and the this and the that and he wasn't happy he was pretty negative and then we got that one delivered and we got a load up to southern Georgia to pick up blueberries up there where they have all the blueberries it's a town that starts with an A but I can't remember the name of it anyway we got up there he drove us up there, but then he was out of hours by the time we got up there because it had took so long to get unloaded and all that. But it was a big wait up there for the blueberries, as it usually is. We got there at 5, and he didn't even finish us till after midnight. So at midnight, I took over. I, I drove us to North Carolina, Bessemer, to Dole up in Bessemer. That was our O2. And I delivered, and then I drove us to a truck stop. Troutdale, North Carolina, I think it is, over there. That pilot, that dump hole pilot. And I took a shower, and then he took over. And before he took over, I told him, I took an atlas out and I showed him on I-35, because he was going up I-35 in West Virginia. And there's a new part of I-35 up there that's GPS's, don't know what you're doing. They think you're out in the woods or something. And they start trying to send you off this way and that way and the other way. To get you back to old 35 where you used to drive. So I showed him. I said, do not get off of I-35 when you get here. And I showed him on the Atlas and I showed him. I said, the GPS will freak out. Just keep going. And I told him this like three times. Lo and behold, we get up there and I'm in the bunk. And I hear him turn off. And I'm like, well must be going to a truck stop or something and then 
I heard my antennas banging and clanging on the trees. And I know that means we ain't supposed to be where we are. So I jump up out of the bed and I go up there and I'm like, how come you turned off? Because by then I know what he did. And he got an attitude. He didn't like being told. But I was irritated because I had told him for three times not to do it. And he still did it. Anyway, I found a little side road I could turn around on. So I had him to let me back it in this side road. And I got us turned around and we went back to 35. So that wasn't any real big deal. And we got up to Springfield, Ohio. He did fine, got us up there. And we were delivering. It took about six hours to get unloaded up there. So it seemed like everywhere we went there was a wait. And then while we were up there, he was all, well, the whole day after the incident on 35, he was grouchy and had an attitude. And I figured, well, he's gonna get off the truck. So then lo and behold, he gets in the truck from outside and he goes, I gotta go home. And I said, well, how come? You're only here for less than a week at that point. And he goes, well, I'm not, I don't have to tell you that. And then I got a little irritated and I'm like, yeah, you do, cause I need to know why. And I told him, no, I can't take you home cause I've already committed to this other load. So if you need to go home, you're gonna have to figure out a way to get there cause it's too soon for you to go home. And he didn't like that and he got out of the truck. But then he come back in a little while I don't know, it wasn't that long. And he was in a different mood, and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll stay. And he was fine. And he didn't go. So then the next day, I had a load. It was another one of them hush-hush loads. And I did that one all by myself. Went up there and got it. It was about 175 miles to go get it. And I got it, and then I drove it to Indiana, and it was about another 300 miles to there. I did all this alone. And then I drove us another 90 miles up to this truck stop after we were done with it. Because we had a load picking up in Yorkland, Indiana. And we waited there. We, we didn't pick that one up till 10 p.m. And we got up to that truck stop about 4, maybe 3.30. So we had time. And he was fine and did his laundry and took his shower and stuff. And I slept. And finally we went and picked that load up in Yorkland. Had to save a lot up there. And that went fine. And he drove us through the night to, because that load was going to Alabama, he drove us to Matthews, Missouri, to the Loves down there. And I said, let's switch out here. Because it was enough of him driving. And I took a shower and got ready to go. I think it was like a couple hours there. And finally we left. The thing of it is, all this waiting and all me taking more time was irritating him, but I didn't know it. But we were driving the same. I was working more than him, or the same as him. That he was all paranoid and thinking I wasn't. So then I drove us from Matthews, Missouri down to Hammond, Louisiana. All the way down there. To the save a lot down there where we were gonna deliver. And I got down there about nine, we didn't deliver till one. So I'm sitting in the front seat and I went back there to see what he was doing. And he wouldn't move off my bunk kind of courteous to move out so I could lay down and wait but he would he didn't move one inch so I went and sat back up front instead of making him get off and then finally we delivered I think it was about 2 a.m. by the time they were done and I was tired and the next load we had had a it was a drop and hook pickup and it had plenty of time like an all-day window so I decided to take some stop sleep there at the save a lot Cause it doesn't hurt and it's good to rejuvenate. So I slept there about six hours and I'm sure he was irritated about that. Then we went up to, I can't remember where it was in Louisiana, up north, some stinky chicken place. It was gross. There was like nasty water floating on the ground with like white shit in it. And smelled the high heavens like a sewer. And he didn't like that. He was all annoyed at that. And I gave him booties for his shoes. Because he was wearing slippers. That's all he did was wear slippers. I'm like, you can't wear your slippers out in the chicken juice. And he was tiptoeing around trying to stay out of it. So we got that picked up and got out of there because it was nasty. And he drove us over to Tyler, Texas. 
And I told him, well, let's change up. So we did. And I drove over to Oklahoma. Altus, I think it is. Bar S over there. Through the night. Again. So I'm doing more nights than him. And then I get over there. And I drop a hook. And I drive us to... This loves over there in Memphis, Texas. He wanted to take a shower, so I let him. Then we continued on, and I finished up in Austin. Not Austin. Amarillo, Texas. Because we were picking up at JBS out there. Tyson. I think it wasn't. It's old JBS, maybe. Anyway. Then we got stuck there waiting for 27 hours for that. And he was flipping out. Mad. He was always mad. And then... I think he was going to get off the truck, but they talked him into not getting off. Somebody did on the phone who he was talking to. So he stayed. And we finally got that picked up on Monday afternoon at like 5 p.m. Monday evening. And we took it. He drove us to Commerce City, Colorado. To McLean. To the, Yeah, to McLean. That didn't take too long. Two, three hours to get unloaded. It was about three in the morning four in the morning when they finally got done and I had took over in the middle of that delivery so he only worked like nine or ten hours and then I took over once it was done I drove us up to Cheyenne Wyoming and got a, a truck wash and uh, fuel and a cup of coffee because I was tired it was early morning like five o'clock in the morning or something I thought well I'll get a cup of coffee and I'll be fine so then I left to head on over to Salt Lake City and out there past uh, Laramie, I got real sleepy. It's dangerous sleepy, you know. So I pulled over on a ramp to sleep. Take a little nap. And he didn't like that. He didn't say anything, but I know he didn't like it. And, oh, I forgot to tell you. Over there in Springfield, Ohio, he said, uh, he asked me, how come you don't run your 11 out? You should run your 11 out. And I said, I don't run my 11 out. I don't need to. Nine and a half for ten hours is plenty for me. And then you can take over and do your nine and a half for eleven. And he was like, alright. So anyway, I'm driving and I took a took the nap. Then I got up and I drove us all the way to Salt Lake City and finished that up to the terminal. And the load didn't deliver till five AM, so I was gonna stop there for a little while. About nine hours. But he was like, let's go. He thought we needed to go right over there or something. I don't know. I'm like, nah, we'll just stay here. It don't deliver till 5 a.m. So then about 3.30 a.m., I I got up. I set my alarm. And I got up. And I got him up. I said, come on, we need to go. And he slowly got up. I think he was finally moving at about almost 4 o'clock in the morning. We had to hook our trailer. And he was doing that super slowly. I don't know what he was doing. But we finally got that done, and we went to Outbound, and we were leaving. And that's where the blowout happened, when we were leaving Outbound. Because he got into it with me about, how come how come your clock didn't reset after you took that nap? And I said, well, it won't reset. It'll just give me back the two hours. So then I can go longer, because it's a split at that point. And I was like, and then he was mumbling something else, and I didn't know what he meant. And he, and he just uh, cut me off. And he goes, well, never mind. I'll just show you. And I was like, all right. Then I was like, uh, it's really none of your business what I'm doing on my clock, on my logs. And we got into it. And he yelled at me that I need to run my 11. Just run your 11. Just run your 11 out. And I said, no, that's not how I run things. And you're not going to run my truck. And we got into it. We were arguing back and forth and then we were heading down the little road just after you leave the, the terminal and he was driving so slow and it irritated me I didn't know where he was trying to get me a service failure or what so I made him let me drive we switched I was like I'm, I'm taking over and then I'm in the driver's seat getting ready to go my phone's over there on the passenger side door because I'd left it there and I said can you hand me my phone and he said no so I had to stop the truck and get over there and get it myself. And I think in our fight I told him I was going to throw his stuff off or something and he was mad about that. 
But oh well. Because he wouldn't get off. I think I told him to get off right there, but he wouldn't do it. And then, so I drove on over. I got us there barely in time down to Cisco at 5 a.m. And he's all mad. And then I got it arranged to get him off the truck. And he was outside talking to somebody and he gets in the truck and he's talking to him about me saying how I'm corny and this and that and I need to just drive my 11 you know he was doing it just to aggravate me and then he got out of the truck again and then he got back in and his mother was on the phone and she was talking so loudly and I'm pretty sure that they oh, let's, I'm going to get in the truck and you talk loud so he can hear what you have to say about it and she was yelling that I should just run my 11 out. And that I'm ridiculous and this and that. You know, they were trying to egg me on. So then he gets out again and I tell Craig, tell my fleet manager, uh, you need to get him out of here. Send someone over here to get him. And then he tells me to have him move her away. And we went back and forth and then we decided I was just going to take him to the Ramada after we were done. But then in a little while, he come in the truck all whistling and happy, acting all happy. And he got his stuff and got out and left. And I was never so happy. I locked the doors and he was gone and I never saw him again. And I really didn't care. Because he's not going to come on and try to run my truck. I told him that too. It's my truck, not yours. I wasn't taking advantage of him. We were both driving the same. But he just wanted it how he wanted it. And he's the type that'll just... No matter what, he'll find a problem. And the next guy's truck, he'll have a problem. He thinks he knows everything. Every time I tried to teach him something, yeah, yeah, I know. He went, he's like that. But anyway. Now I'm back over here at uh, Terminal. I got another load. I'm going out to Oregon. I already got another, another student. In fact, I had him before the other guy was gone. So it was no skin off my back. This guy sounds like he'll be good. I talked to him. But you never know. You can only hope for the best. But anyway, I'm going out there to pick him up. He lives out in uh, Boonies in Oregon. And then we're going to deliver over there by Portland to a Kroger. Then we got to go up in Washington and deliver. So right now I'm doing some laundry. And then I'm going to get over there and pick that load up. It's supposed to be picked up by 9 p.m., but I'll be there before that. But anyway, that's my story. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I'll have some more for you, probably. But y'all take care. Y'all be nice. Y'all have a good one. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.